Um, like Dennis said, my name is Matt Harvey. I work with the Citizens Utility Board, or CUB. Um, so we'll just dive right into it. But before we do, I'll go over briefly who CUB is and what we do. Um, so CUB, or the Citizens Utility Board, represents utility ratepayers like yourselves. So what we mean by that is whenever the utility companies attempt to maybe raise their rates or pass some legislation that isn't very consumer friendly, we're the organization who goes after them. Um, so we're in your corner as ratepayers trying to fight the good fight and make sure that the utility companies are playing by the rules. And that includes electric, gas, and then telephone companies as well, which is largely what we'll cover today. Um, our MO is helping folks out. So we do have a hotline. Uh, if there's one thing that you remember today, let it be that we have this 1-800 number that you see there under helps individuals. It's our hotline. It's Monday through Friday, nine to four. We have a bunch of awesome folks who staff that phone um, who can help you out with any utility related questions. So, you know, after this, if you do have any lingering questions or forgot to ask something, no sweat, you can always give us a ring and we're happy to um, hash those details out with you. We also have a really great website that citizensutilityboard.org link there. A lot of the things that I'll speak about today are actually housed on our website. So our communications team, shout out to Jim and his staff. Um, they put together really great fact sheets and guides and resources that we can tap into, into to better educate ourselves um, you know, about various utility related topics. So definitely check that out. Um, but ultimately we really focus on getting the word out there and um, just kind of doing general community education. Uh, we do about 500 events a year similar stuff to this. Prior to the pandemic, we were out in person at library. So we probably would have been in person, you know, a few years ago, um, hanging out in the library together. However, we've been doing a lot of stuff virtual this year um, and over the pandemic years as well. Um, so, but we're still doing a ton of stuff. So we do have a calendar online that you can check out on that citizensutilityboard.org link. Um, we have, a, a, you know, various events of various topics covering a lot of different things. So definitely check us out there. Um, we also have a ton of media and publications. I kind of alluded to this when I was talking about our communications team. They put together a lot of really great resources. And again, on our website, you can check that out. However, I wanna to highlight too, it's the guide to cutting cable TV costs as well as the guide to fighting robocalls. Those are the two guides I use to kind of guide myself when I'm going over these slides. Um, so I'll be sure at the end to um, both link both of those guides. And then I can also send them to Dennis or we, we can figure that out, Dennis, where maybe I can send it out to everybody who attended. But um, after the fact, I'll send a follow-up email uh, that will include both of those guides. So you can kind of have something to take home and, and go through. And there's some really cool like worksheets and stuff in there that you can utilize when you're kind of going through stuff related to cutting your cable costs as well as fighting robocalls. With that being said, we'll, we'll just go ahead and dive into it. I always like to start with this slide because I think it's a really important frame. I think it's why a lot of folks are here. The typical cable package in the United States is super, super, super expensive. It's approximately $200. I think it's $217 to be specific. That's what most folks are paying. And they're paying for about 200 plus channels, ton of channels, which in theory, it's not bad. A dollar per channel, you know, 200 channels, that, that seems like a pretty good deal. However, the average channels watched are about 17. So most folks are watching, you know, approximately 17 channels, but you're paying $200 for those 17 channels. The current paradigm for cable seems to be a bit broke. It seems to be pretty expensive and in some ways is becoming kind of antiquated. So I think it's important to kind of shop around and to check out our options and just kind of understand exactly, you know, the different ways that we can watch TV. Um, because again, it is like the traditional way we're paying for cable is just becoming super expensive and you're just paying for things that you're not necessarily using. Um, so I'm going to go over the various ways we can watch and I'm going to kind of list some of the pros and cons just because not every package or not every way to watch is, is the right way for everybody. There's no real like silver bullet. Um, so I like to just kind of go over the various different programs and, and the different options we have as well as their pros and cons. So the first one is over the air TV, which is the, the oldest version of television. This is the major networks delivered to your home through an antenna, like the one picture on the right. This is major networks like ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, WGN. It's the local stuff, right? If you wanna catch the local news, this is where you would do it. The biggest pro, it's free. Um, you know, you can't beat free. However, you do need an antenna or some kind of like technology to access it. So free day to day. However, you, there is a startup cost, right? Because if you don't have an antenna, you can't access that. So you'd have to purchase an antenna. 
Um, but the biggest con is that the choices are pretty limited. It's mostly kind of boiled down to local news and a few other programs. Um, and then the reception can be pretty unreliable or poor. It's kind of subject to weather, um, right? So if it's like you have an antenna like the one picture on the right, it's on your home or outside of your home and it's super rainy out or really windy, that might affect your reception. So it's free, but choice is limited. Reception can be pretty poor. We have traditional cable, and this is what most folks in the room probably have, or they probably have some version of this. This is the, the most common type of cable that folks have. And this is TV that's delivered to your home via fiber optic or coaxial cable, which is the one picture on the right. And this is companies like Comcast, WOW, RCN, like the major companies that you see being advertised around Illinois. They're the folks utilizing this technology. Um, the pros are you do get a ton of channel choices. So when I alluded to like the average cable package, you do get a lot of channels, right? And if you're watching all of them, it might make sense for you to utilize traditional cable, right? So it is a lot of choices. However, people are paying a ton of money to utilize it. So biggest con is it is super expensive. It can cost anywhere from 60 to 150, 200 bucks. Uh, and it's not available everywhere. So folks who might live in more rural communities might not have access to traditional cable. Um, I also like to mention telco TV, just to be a bit more specific. Um, and to cover all of our bases, this is very similar to tradi traditional cable. The only difference is this is provided by landline phone companies. So in some cases you could get it through a copper phone line. Most times it's over fiber optic if that is in your area. So this is companies like AT&T, Uverse, Verizon. Um, pros and cons are similar or they're the same as traditional cable. A lot of channel choices. However, it's super expensive and it's also not available everywhere. So rural communities might not have access to this. This option, satellite television, is if you know somebody who lives in a rural community who might not receive traditional cable, this would be the option for you. This is TV delivered to your home via satellite, like the one pictured on the left. And these are major companies like DirecTV and Dish Network. Pros are very similar to traditional cable and telco TV. This has a lot of channel choices. And then the other pro is that it's also available in rural areas. So if you might not be able to receive that traditional cable, you could use this as a way to, to access that. Cons are is it's very expensive, even more so than telco or traditional TV, typically cost anywhere from 70 to 200 bucks. Um, and then also the reception can be poor because you're um, relying on a satellite, oftentimes installed outside of your home. So if the weather's really bad that day, you might have poor reception. Um, and then the last con is that it actually requires installation of a satellite dish. So that might not be um, the most desirable thing for some folks to have to install kind of a bulkier piece of equipment on the outside of your home or your rooftop. The last one I wanna mention is the new kit on the block. This is streaming services, probably the newest way to watch television. This is programming over the internet for a monthly subscription. Amazon Prime, HBO Max, Netflix, Hulu, Sling TV, there's a ton of them now. Um, Dennis and I were actually talking about this. It's like used to be just a few companies, but now there are a ton of folks like building out this infrastructure for streaming. Um, but again, the idea is that you would subscribe to one of these applications, which would then allow you to start streaming content or watching television, movies, documentaries on demand. Um, the pros for this is that it is a bit cheaper than traditional cable in some ways. Um, typically, the subscription costs for these applications are anywhere from five to 20 bucks. Um, so, you know, in some ways, it could maybe be a little more expensive if you subscribe to every single one that exists. Um, however, if you're choosing carefully and picking the programs that, or excuse me, the um, subscription services that best fit your, you know, watching habits, it could be a bit cheaper. Um, there are a ton of choices for programming. Thousands and thousands of movies, TV shows, documentaries are housed on these applications. So there is a lot of choice built into here. And it is customized programming. What I mean by that is that these apps use really sophisticated algorithms to kind of watch what you're watching to help you kind of build out a list of potential shows you would like. So it'll see, oh, they watch a lot of home and gardening television shows. And then it would have, you know, things that would be in that category for you. So it's a really nice way to kind of discover new content without being locked into kind of what you've always been watching. Um, it is pretty convenient to sign up to. A lot of these are, well, I guess every single one has a website, which is where you would sign up for their programming. Um, the cons are that you would need high-speed internet or you need high-speed internet in order to access this programming. You have slower internet. Um, it might not be equipped to, to do streaming because streaming does take a, a higher uh, bandwidth. However, most 
homes probably have internet speed that can accommodate streaming. Um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, that wasn't the case, but now most folks are paying for internet that's anywhere from like 25 to a gigabyte, 25 megabytes to a gigabyte worth of internet, which is more than enough. Um, it also requires a smart TV or a streaming device. So it, it requires a special kind of device in order to watch this stuff. You can do it over your browser, um, you know, on your computer, but you can also do it on your television. And your television either needs to be a smart one, which most of the newer TVs are, or you need a streaming device, which is kind of similar to like a DVD player. In some ways, it's just kind of a little device that you hook up to your TV that helps you access this stuff. Um, and the last one is a really important one to note is that streaming hasn't quite figured out live content yet. There is a bit of limited live content and it can be really expensive for the live content that already does exist. So things like sports, news, you know, your, your favorite like American Idol, that kind of television stuff that airs every Thursday or whatever it might be, um, is, is kind of difficult to watch via streaming. They are coming up with some solutions, but it, you know, it, it can be expensive to tap into that stuff, but they are currently working on it. Um, so those are all the choices. Um, you know, again, there are a lot of pros and cons for each. And I think the, the, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but I think probably the best one for most folks is actually streaming because of the price and what you have access to. Um, but there is some legwork that is required to get set up for streaming. So it might not be for everybody, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. But before I do get into that, we always like to go over just like general tips on cutting your cable bill, which can be a whole thing. I actually just went through it myself. I don't have a cable bill, but I pay for an internet bill through Comcast. Um, and, you know, my girlfriend and I have been living in the same apartment for this is our second year now. So my initial contract with the company expired. So I had to kind of go through this song and dance and actually utilize some of these tactics. So I think it's important to kind of go over these and know exactly what's going on with these tactics. So before you call the cable company, it's really important that you check each line of your bill and just, you know, take account of all the charges you don't necessarily understand. You never know, there might be some things that you could take off of your bill or lower. So just kind of like highlight those things. And at the very least, knowledge is power. So just to know exactly what those weird charges are and have somebody from the company explain them, I think could be a good thing. Um, you can also find hidden deals. And what I mean by that is that, um, for example, when I was looking for an internet deal, if I were to go on my internet browser at home and search, you know, Comcast current internet contracts or how much does it cost for Comcast internet to see what the newer deals are, it's not going to give me those because it recognizes that I'm using the internet through them. So using their technology, they're going to spit out some contracts that are fit for me that are going to be a bit more expensive. However, if I were to look at my phone perhaps and turn off my Wi-Fi and, and search you know, current Comcast contracts for internet, they're going to give me a completely different set of contracts or deals. They're going to give me stuff that's designed for new customers. Unfortunately, when you're, you're shopping around for internet or cable or television, they tend to benefit, or they tend to give better contracts to new customers. Uh, and then again, if they know that you're using the internet that's tied to that cable or tied to that contract, it's just going to give you the same old contract, if not a bit more expensive. So what you want to do is you want to either use your cell phone if you have a cell phone that's connected to Wi-Fi and turn it off and search for some contracts or go to a neighbor's house, a friend's house, ask them to maybe search that for you, even go to the library and utilize their computers to see exactly what the current contracts are for new customers. Because you can use that as kind of a bargaining chip to negotiate down your cost. You can say, hey, I'm a loyal customer. I have been for several years and you're giving these new customers like half of what I'm paying for or you know, they're, you're giving them what I have for half the cost, what's going on, can I get a better contract? Using that kind of information can be really useful when you're negotiating these contracts. Um, also finding out what the current competition charges. So in a similar vein, looking at, you know, if you're with Comcasting, what at and is offering, what WOW's offering, what RCN's offering, that way you have a bargaining chip when you're going through and you can say, look, I know you're charging new customers. This is what other companies are charging. Why shouldn't I go with them when it's half the cost? Uh, and it's also good because if, you know, for some reason, when you're on the phone with the, the cable company and they're not willing to lower your bill or they're, they're, you know, standing tight on this stuff, it might be worthwhile to perhaps switch to a different company and you've done your homework so you'll know which ones are the cheapest. So those are some things I'd recommend to do before you call the cable company. But while you're on the phone with the cable company, the, the first thing you need to do, and I think one of the most important things is to request the cancellation 
and or retention department. The retention department exists to retain your service. So they're there to just like solely retain your service and to try to negotiate with you. Whereas if you just call their normal hotline, you kind of go through all the different prompts, you're gonna end up getting on the line with a customer service representative or a sales representative who ultimately is incentivized to charge you more money, right? They're gonna to try to get you to stay with the same contract and maybe sign up for something that's even a bit more expensive. So you wanna request the cancellation or retention department because again, they exist to retain your service. So they're gonna be more willing to negotiate with you because their job is to keep you with their particular company. Um, and I, the reason I have cancellation slash retention is it's, they go by a different name for every company, but it's generally speaking cancellation or retention. And the folks who you speak with on the phone will know who that is. So they'll, they'll send you to the appropriate person. Um, and then this is kind of the golden rule too, right? Be nice, but firm. Don't be a jerk. Nobody likes a jerk. They're going to be less willing to work with you or give you a better deal if you're not being very nice to them, um, which can, can be really difficult. I know I've gone through it myself. Sometimes you just want to like throw something at the, the person on the other line because it's expensive. You're going through all these prompts, but it's important to just be kind and know they're just, you know, working a job, but also to be firm and, you know, to put your foot down and not to be afraid to ask for a better deal. Um, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but don't get upsold. A lot of times they're like, oh, okay, we'll try to get you with something cheaper. However, you know, there's this new package we have out. It's a little more expensive, you know, $5 more expensive, $10 more expensive, or you're going to get way more stuff. They're going to try to upsell you to, to get you to pay more. So you want to be careful to not do that because you're calling to reduce your bill, not to add additional things on there. Um, one of the other things is to, to be open to locking it in. And what I mean by that is that um, sometimes the companies will offer you a better rate if you're willing to sign longer contracts, if they know that you'll stick around for two years, maybe they're more willing to, to give you a better rate. Then of course, take notes. Um, you never know, you might not get what you need the first time you call. In some cases, unfortunately, you have to call them a couple times. So you wanna make sure you're taking notes and being thorough. So that if you do need to call back, you can reference what you, you spoke about with the prior customer service representative. Um, another thing I wanna know, and this is a little off topic, but I always like to, to tell folks about it. Um, you can buy your own modem. A lot of times the companies will try to get you to keep their infrastructure in your home. So their modem and their router oftentimes is like combined into one thing, uh, but they charge you for it. Typically it's like anywhere from 10 to $20 a month. They charge you to keep that, that inter internet device. However, um, you can go to Best Buy or Target or even Walmart and you can purchase a router and a modem separately. Um, it costs anywhere for both about $100 to $150. Seems like kind of a, a, a steep cost. However, if you're, you're paying $20 a month for their particular equipment, it's gonna end up costing you way more over the length of the contract with these companies. So if you're using internet, you have been for several years, you've been paying that 15 to $20 a month, you're gonna end up spending way more than 100 or $150 on their modem. So um, if you feel comfortable doing that, I definitely encourage folks to, to look into getting their own equipment. However, I should note that Comcast is one of the only companies that allows you to buy your own modem. AT&T does not. I know WOW and RCN do, but only for certain packages. So you need to be careful um, you know, and make sure you can do that with your company. So I definitely just encourage you to call them if you are interested in buying your own equipment and just seeing if you're, you're able to do that with your particular contract. If you can, definitely do it. Um, I'll also include a fact sheet about buying your own modem with the other guides that I mentioned in the beginning, we put together kind of a one pager that talks about pros and cons of that and like what's the best way to go about that. So I'll be sure to include that as well. Now, one of the best ways to reduce your cable bill ultimately is to give up your cable service. And I, I kind of alluded to this in the beginning, but we think streaming is probably one of the best ways to reduce your cable bill if it's done um, in a way that makes sense for you and your watching habits, things like that. Um, again, streaming is the, it's programming over the internet for a monthly subscription. Um, what do you need to stream TV and movies in your home? We talked a little bit about this, but we can go in more detail. One of the first things is a TV that's equipped to do streaming or a smart TV, which if you have a new TV from the past like five, six years, most likely it's going to have the streaming services built in. They look a little bit like this, kind of like a smartphone screen where you have the apps that come up and you simply just need to use your remote to navigate to them, click on them, put in your information, and then you start streaming from there. 
Um, but you don't need a smart TV to watch streaming. You can use an older TV equipped with a streaming device, which there are a few different ones. This one, I have the, the main kind of the most popular ones listed below Roku, which looks a little bit like this, it's just a little USB port that you plug into the side of your TV with the remote. Then there's Apple TV, which is just a little box that would sit down kind of like a DVD player, but a bit smaller. And there's Amazon's Fire Stick, very similar to the Roku. Comcast has their own called Xfinity Flex. Um, it streams in 4K if you have a TV that's um, equipped to do that kind of streaming or you know, has that kind of resolution for that streaming. However, the biggest pro for theirs is that it is free. If you are a um, Comcast subscriber, they will send you one of these things for free. You have to end up, you know, you have to return it once you're done, but they do have a free one. So if you don't want to buy one of these other products, which are traditionally like 30 to 50 bucks, you get a free one if you have Xfinity. Um, and then last but not least, you also need, I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, but you do need a good wireless internet connection, something that can sustain the kind of streaming that you're doing in the home. It doesn't need to be anything crazy. I think Netflix recommends about 20 to 25 megabytes per second. However, if you have a lot of folks in the home who might be streaming at the same time, you might need something that's a, a little bit quicker. Um, but I think, again, most folks nowadays probably have an internet speed that's good enough for streaming. So there are a ton of streaming services. This is just kind of a snapshot of some of the main ones or the most popular ones. But I always like to show this slide here because um, it goes to show there are a ton of them. And ultimately, this stuff could, can be more expensive than paying for traditional cable if you end up subscribing to a million, right? So if you subscribe to every single one on the slide, you'd end up paying probably a bit more than you are for cable. So we always encourage folks, if you are interested in streaming, um, to kind of look into the individual streaming services and see exactly what kind of content they're providing. That way you can hand select or pick the streaming services that have the content you want. Um, and you, you know they have the shows and the movies and the, the, the kind of programming that makes the most sense for you. That way you can pick like one or two or three of them. Um, and then you can just stick with that. So that way it guarantees that it's, it's a bit cheaper than cable, but you're getting the kind of content that you want. Now, a lot of folks don't want to give up stuff like the local news or maybe even the local ball game, and you don't have to. There, there is some technology out there that can help you still get that stuff for free, um, and that's through a digital antenna, which is a HD antenna that you can put, you know, like in a window or on top of your TV that can help you supplement your streaming service, giving you those local channels. So it's, it's you know, over the air television, like I mentioned in the beginning, it's one of the oldest tried and true. Uh, but the technology has gotten a little better so you can get these newer antennas that can help you access those local channels so that way you don't have to give up that stuff and you can still take advantage of the streaming services. Um, there are some things to know about HD antennas. One of the first ones is just kind of what channels are available to you and you might already know this if you do have an HD antenna or you've had one in the past. However, there are some good resources online like this FCC.gov link, TV full link, and the antennaweb.org. You can check these out and you can type in your address or your zip code and they'll give you kind of a list of the, the television channels that you'll have access to, as well as the, the quality of the connection you'll have to these shows in your location. So it's a good way to see exactly what's on there, see if you'll still have connection to those. You also need to make sure you have the right television, which most folks probably do, um, because you need something called a digital tuner, which prior to 2006, you might have needed to buy a separate one. However, um, there is a law that was passed in the United States where all TVs built after 2006 need to have a digital tuner built in. So the, the case for you all is probably that you have a digital tuner in your TV and you don't need to worry about that. But if you have a super old TV, you might need to look into getting a separate digital tuner. But I think even prior to 2006, most of the televisions had that built in. You also want to make sure you have the right type of antenna. There are a few different kinds. It really breaks down to how close you are to the connection or to the service of these, these television channels. Um, so there's omnidirectional versus directional. Omnidirectional is if you were living farther away from an urban area where the, the signal might be coming from, you would need to point your antenna towards it and omnidirectional, or excuse me, that would be directional, um, getting them mixed up. So you would need to point the directional um, antenna towards the signal. However, an omnidirectional antenna would receive the signal from all around. So it'd be better if you're kind of closer to the 
closer to the, the signal. If you live more in an urban area, it's for you. Amplified versus not amplified is under the same premise. You would need an amplified signal if you are living a bit farther away from the connection, which you can again figure this out through some of these links over to the left here. That FCC.gov link is a good one. Um, and then not amplified is, is traditionally a cheaper antenna. Um, and it's better for folks who look closer to the signal. You would need to amplify in order to have access to that. Uh, and then indoor and outdoor, same kind of thing. Um, indoor is going to have, you know, a bit less quality reception compared to an outdoor antenna. Um, however, the outdoor antennas can be pretty expensive. And in some cases, you need to install them on your home. Um, but we find that the HD antennas that you can get where you put them on a windowsill work just fine. And they usually cost about 30 bucks. So it's more of a price difference. But these are things to note too. If you if you don't have an antenna that's equipped to do this stuff right now, you're looking into it, definitely look into some of these websites and make sure that you're buying the right one so you have um, you know, good quality access to the channels you wanna watch. So I did some back of the napkin um, cutting your TV related costs, just kind of like what it would cost monthly and what the startup would cost. Um, so you can look here, the startup cost on the left, Let's say you get an HD antenna that costs about 30 bucks. You're also looking at a uh, streaming device because you don't have a smart TV in this example. Costs you anywhere from 35 to $50. So that comes out to about 30 to $80 total for an installation cost for like your very startup cost if you don't have any equipment that can handle this stuff. And then you also need to think about your monthly costs for the particular subscriptions or the services you're, you're um, looking into. So in this one, I did kind of the main like four, which is Netflix, HBO, Disney Plus, and Hulu. Currently, Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN have like a, you know, this like triple package going on where you, if you subscribe to Hulu, you get all three of these, or excuse me, Disney Plus, you get all three of these for 14 bucks. Um, so definitely check that out. That's interesting. But all of those ultimately come out to about $38 a month, 38 to 40 bucks a month. Um, so really it's about a hundred odd dollars to get started which for most folks would be cheaper than just their cable bill alone. So at the end of the day, once you get all of that equipment, your monthly cost is really anywhere from, you know, 30 to 50 bucks for these streaming services, which is, is a bit less than what you're paying for traditional cable. And for the streaming services that I listed in this example, there, there's a lot of content there. So you're getting a lot for just paying 40 bucks. So one last note before we switch over to robocalls is that um, there is a really great program out there for folks who are income qualified called the Affordable Connectivity Program. So you do need a solid internet connection, like I mentioned earlier, to have access to streaming services. But if you're worried about being able to afford one or maybe even bumping up your internet speed in order to, to access this content, it might be worthwhile checking out this FCC.gov slash ACP link, because this is a program that provides a discount of up to $30 per month towards your internet service and then 75 per month if you're on a qualifying tribal land. Uh, and then you also get a discount $100, up to a one-time discount of $100 for um, a laptop, a desktop computer, or a tablet from participating providers if you don't already have something like that. Um, this was a program that was originally started due to the pandemic and they decided to keep it around, which is great. So folks who are income qualified, or you feel like you might be able to, to qualify for this program, I definitely encourage you to check out that link at the bottom. Um, that way you can kind of check it out and see exactly what the program entails. Then you can also see if you're qualified. Because if you are, definitely worthwhile signing up to, to kind of help alleviate the burden of the internet bill. So with that being said, we'll move on to robocalls. I know they're, they're kind of intertwined, right? We like to make these presentations cover both of the topics because oftentimes when you're paying for your, your cable bill, your television's included in that. And it feels like, uh, excuse me, your, your, your television bill, your, your phone is also included in that. But it feels like most of the time, the calls that we're getting on our phones, even cell phones, are robocalls, which robocalls are pre-recorded messages from computer-generated dials. Um, it, it, could, it gets kind of crazy. I feel like you know every other call that I get on my cell phone now typically is a scam or is coming from call, some call center or some robocall. And it, it, it feels that way because Illinois actually ranks eighth in the nation for highest number of robocalls. So um, I got this from Umail, it's a robocall index online and they, they look at some of the metrics for robocalls from state to state. They find that Illinois in the month of February got 145 million different robocalls and that's a month. It changes every month, but it's pretty consistent with that number. 
So we're receiving a lot of these robocalls. And to, to go even more granular with that data, across the United States, the average person is receiving 11.5 robocalls a month, which amounts to about 1,000 and a half per second, which is 5.6 million an hour. It's crazy. There are a lot of different calls that are being placed. And the makeup of these calls is, uh, is, is pretty wild. So if you look here, this is from the same email index, it looks like 63% of the robocalls we're getting are either telemarketing or scams. Whereas the, the other half is alerts and reminders or payment reminders. So that kind of begs the question of whether or not robocalls are legal. A lot of folks are like, you know, what's going on here? Why do I get all these? Is this even legal? And the answer is that most of them are not. Um, a lot of them are legal calls. However, there are some cases where these robocalls are legal. So it's only if they're not sales calls, unless they have written permission from the Federal Trade Commission. And the other allowed pre-recorded messages include information calls, debt collectors from or on behalf of politicians, healthcare providers, banks, phone carriers, and other charities. So it's stuff that you would want to receive a call for, right? So if you have a medical appointment coming up, they can send you a robocall to remind you. Or for example, if Cub is doing a community event in your neighborhood, we can send out a robocall to remind folks in the area that we're doing it. Um, so that kind of stuff is allowed and I think is important to use because it is a good technology. But unfortunately, the majority of the calls that are being placed are, are basically scams or they're somebody trying to sell you something which one out of 10 Americans are actually scammed each year, which amounts to $9.5 billion. Um, so, you know, it's, it's important to be careful when you're answering these robocalls because they are pretty tricky. And a lot of folks, unfortunately, fall victim to some of the, the scams that these folks are carrying out. However, in the end of 19, or at the end of 2019, the TRACE Act became federal law, which is the Telephone Robocall Abuse Criminal Enforcement and Deterrence. Act, which is, is a mouthful there, but basically what this did is it extended the statute of limitations for law enforcement to go after scammers, which translates to they just gave kind of, uh, you know, more money and a better infrastructure for law enforcement to go after some of these hard to get scammers. Um, and it also increases the penalties. So if these folks do get caught, the penalties for being caught are a bit more, um, you know, strict, which hopefully would deter some of the folks from doing this. And then it also requires some of the bigger phone companies to validate calls, meaning that they need to, um, you know, create some infrastructure, some technology that can better help filter them. However, this did pass in 2019. A lot of these provisions are, are currently taking effect. We're still getting a lot of robocalls, right? The challenge with this stuff is that these scammers are essentially breaking the law. So to create additional legislation or more laws um, might not be the best way to handle it because they might just continue breaking these laws, right? Um, they're already doing it in the first place. So I think it's important to, to kind of highlight the benefits of the TRACE Act because it did kind of increase an in infrastructure for us to go after these folks. However, I think there is more that needs to be done, but it is a really tricky industry to, to tackle because they are pretty elusive and they're, they're constantly evolving with the technology. Um, and that's because they use something called spoofing, which is where they'll use an area code or a prefix that looks local to you um, I grew up in Lake County, so my prefix is 847, and I get these 847 calls all of the time. Um, and it, it's, you know, to make it look like it's a friend or a family member calling you, somebody who maybe got a new number who you grew up with, um, that's the way they do it. So it's hard to identify whether or not these are spam calls. Um, and they're pre-generated numbers, so they're constantly changing these numbers to fit what they're doing. There are a few um, scams we want to highlight. And then there's, of course, the IRS and Social Security can't scam, which feels like it's as old as time nowadays. Um, th these scams have been around for a while. You know, it's where they call and they say, oh, you owe the IRS money. It's tax season. Give us a call at this number. Um, you need to be really careful with those because that's just a, a, you're basically fishing for your information. It's COVID-19 tricks where they're saying, you know, hey, COVID-19, there's some money going around that the federal government created give this number a call and we can set you up with that, that money. Um, there's, of course, say yes scams, which oftentimes it's when you'll get a call and it sounds like there's nobody on the line and they'll say, hello, hello, is anybody there? And they're trying to get you to say yes or no because they're trying to stitch together that kind of audio to get you to sign on to whatever contract they're selling or thing they're doing. And then, of course, this hits close to home for Cub. There are electric and gas companies 
um, that conduct these scams. They call it, they're called alternative retail electric and gas suppliers. And these Aries or ARGs are companies that will call you, you, you see them at the movie theater, at hardware stores, they're at street festivals, they come door to door, um, but they also conduct a lot of marketing, you know, marketing campaigns over the phone, trying to get you to sign up with their contract, oftentimes touting that they're cheaper than the utility company, um, which most of the time they're not. But in some cases, they'll even say that they are the utility company in hopes of getting you to sign up with their company, um, which oftentimes the rates that they're offering are, are substantially higher than what the regulated utilities are charging. So definitely stay away from those. It's really important to not answer any questions, especially the yes or no questions, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago. But um, I always like to highlight that because those are pretty tricky because a lot of times when I'm you know, in my car, or I'm taking a walk or I'm, I'm busy doing something, I get a call and I just pick up my phone and answer. You hear that, hey, can you hear me? Hello, hello. And it's hard not to say, yes, yes, I can hear you. Um, so if it is a number that you don't recognize and you hear that, it's important to be wary and maybe, you know, hang up. And if it's, you know, somebody that's important or somebody that needs to get a hold of you, they'll just call you back and leave a voicemail. So we do have a few tips as to how you can fight these robocalls. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. It's really just a couple of tips or, or methods you can use to reduce the number that you get or reduce the frequency of the calls being made to your home. So the first one is just, of course, don't answer unknown numbers. I just mentioned this, but utilizing your voicemail is a really important way to, to reduce these, just not answering the numbers. Because when you start picking up, they know you're picking up and they're just gonna call more. Um, so if you do answer a robocall, make sure you do hang up immediately. You know, If, if it is important, they're gonna call back and leave you a voicemail. Um, also, don't call back or follow any instructions. So if somebody leaves a voicemail um, or it's a robocall and it's like a computer generated message and they say, hey, send us an email here or you need to give us a call because you owe XYZ money, um, don't do that. Oftentimes it's just linking you up with the scammer. So people always ask, well, you know, can robocalls be stopped? Unfortunately, they can't. There really isn't a silver bullet, as I mentioned, um, but there are a few things that you can do that are a little, you know, that go a bit further than just not answering the phone. The first one is confirming that you're on the do not call list, which is that 188-382-1222 number. Um, you can also go online at the do not call.gov link there and you can confirm that you're on that list. Unfortunately, this list just bars you from, you know, getting calls from telemarketers, which is great, but a lot of these folks are still kind of circumventing that and calling you anyways, but it does help. It will eliminate some of those calls. Of course, use your voicemail, which we talked about earlier, and then also see what your phone can do for you. A lot of times the phone companies have different um, programs that you can utilize in order to reduce the, the frequency of these calls. Oftentimes they'll filter them for you. Uh, and then also you can, if you're using a cell phone, you can block certain calls. So I kind of do a, a step-by-step -step is how you can do that on your smartphones. This is how you would do it on the iPhone. So if you, if you have an iPhone, you can pull up your list of recent calls. And if there's a, a number that keeps bothering you or you notice there's you know, a number or two that, that is tied to one of these scammers, you can pull up your recent call and you can click on that I there or tap on that I that's next to that number. And then it should pull up a menu like you can see in the, the middle one. And you can tap on block this caller and you click on block contact and that number is blocked. They won't be able to contact you anymore. So that's a good way to, to handle numbers that continue to call. Um, a lot of times they'll use randomly generated numbers. So this might not work for that, but in some cases they do use the same number. So this is the same for Android phones. They also have a function um, similar to the one that's on the iPhone. What you would do is you bring up your list of recent calls, you would tap on the caller's name, and then you would press in and, and long hold on that, that number, which would then pull up a little menu. You would swipe down and then you would select block. And then of course you would confirm that on the block number window does the same thing as the iPhone. It would block that number and that number is no longer able to contact you over text and or call. So unfortunately landlines don't have uh, functions that are, are similar to that, but they do have call blocking options and a few others too. So of course there's voicemail. So if you don't already have voicemail, um, definitely any, you get a lot of robocalls and you wanna filter them, definitely encourage you to get voicemail, but most folks probably already have that. Um, there are call blocking devices that you can utilize, but they are pretty expensive. They can cost anywhere from seventy to eighty dollars, um, and they don't—they're not, you know, one hundred percent foolproof. So they might not work one hundred percent, and they do cost a little bit of money. Something to note. 
There is the AT&T Star 60 service, which costs about $11 a month, and it allows you to block up to 10 numbers from a local area. So if you do have a landline, you're getting all those calls and you notice it's coming from, you know, a few different numbers and they, they keep calling you, it might be worthwhile looking to this service and paying a little bit to, to block those numbers. Digital phones, which is Uverse, Xfinity, Wow, RCN, it's a little bit different than a landline telephone, but if you have like a triple play package through Comcast or Xfinity, for example, your phone isn't a traditional landline, you're not getting it through the copper wires anymore, it's coming from your internet or a VoIP, voice over the internet protocol phone. Um, they have a few more options that you can utilize here. So there are various star codes that your provider might offer you. So you could call your provider or go online to see which star codes work with your service, see if there's anything that can help you limit them. Um, and a lot of times they have free call blocking services, especially after the Trace Act passed, they've been kind of buffing up their infrastructure to handle this. So a lot of times you can go to your online account and activate them. Um, which down here we have att.com. You can search for call blocking for digital phone, give them a ring at this 1 800 number as well. Um, and then, of course, Comcast has one through xfinity.com, but theirs is called call screening, or you can call them at 1 800 934 6489. Um, and again, the, the pack, I'm kind of going over this quickly, but the guides and the packets that I'll send after this for follow up have some more detailed information about this stuff where you can kind of go through step by step and check it out online. So the fourth step to reducing robocalls is seeing what other third party services are available. There are a few different ones. AT&T has one called Call Protect. Sprint has one called Premium Caller ID. T-Mobile has one called Scam ID, Scam Block and Name ID, kind of a mouthful. Then Verizon has one called Call Filter. There are also third party apps you can use on your phone. Um, you know, Umail is one of them. They're, they're the folks where I get a lot of my metrics and data from. Um, so you can definitely check out that. But they might be worth entertaining as well if you feel like your cell phone isn't filtering this stuff. But unfortunately, a lot of the new technologies that are coming out that can kind of prevent these robocalls are, are being developed for our smartphones. So we're, we're a bit limited when it comes to stuff um, that exists for our landlines as well as our um, VoIP service phones. But with that being said, that kind of wraps up my presentation. And I'm happy to stay online here and answer a few questions if you all have them. So I will stop. Well, first I'll, I'll share this screen here, which has my email, mharvey at citizensutilityboard.org, as well as Cubs Hotline, that 1-800 number there. So you can feel free to give us a call if you do have any questions um, or you, know, you, you forget to ask something today, but then you remember the next day, you can always give us a call and we're happy to talk about that stuff. And I'll also drop my email in the chat.